All right, so it's time for our second talk. This is Ken Gagney, who is glowing infinitum with blogging. Hey. Good morning. Thank you for coming to the second talk of the first full day of the 30th Kansas Fest. Appreciate your patience, alertness, and more patience. So I'm here today to talk to you about not just GS, which you may be familiar with me from, or such films as Fever Pitch and Disc, but blogging, blogging about the Apple II. Uh, let's see, I want to talk to you a little bit about my own blog to start and how you can replicate its fantastic success and how you can come up with ideas of things to say about the Apple II because I've seen so many fantastic hardware and software programs. Dieter's Mode 7 demo is amazing. We've written about that and Portal and Kerbal all in JuiceGS, but not all of us have that particular level of talent. We may strive for it, and some of us may achieve it, but not all of us are cut out to be hardware developers. We might not be soldering masters like Vince Briel. We might not be software developers or crackers or uh, even magazine layout artists, but we all have something to say. We all have stories to share, and blogging is one of my favorite ways to share your own stories. And I'd like to give you the tools you need to tell your story online. So my own blog is where I tell my stories and I want to tell you why I created yet another Apple II blog and there are already so many out there. So back around like eight years ago my two favorite sources for Apple II stories were a2central.com was the first one and at one point Sean Fahey posted a great story about how he was introduced to the Apple II as a kid and how he was brought to his father's workplace and he thought he was actually talking to the computer and it was using speech synthesis to talk back. And he found out that it was actually like his dad in the other room on a microphone. It was a really funny story and I really got to know more about Sean from that story. But it wasn't what I went to A2 Central looking for. I thought this was a news website and it seemed surprising to find a personal narrative there. I thought that would be a great story to share on somebody's personal blog. So I thought A2 Central, isn't that for news? That's what I was going there for. There was also the Juice GS website, which as a result of a Kansas Fest presentation and a set of focus group, added a blog. And I told the Juice GS staff, if you ever have anything you want to contribute to the Juice GS blog, you're welcome to. It doesn't have to be all me. So Ryan Suinaga contributed a blog post, and before I published it, I read it, and it had nothing to do with Juice GS. And I said, Ryan, how does this tie into the website of the magazine you're publishing it on. And he said, you didn't say it had to. It's just about the Apple II. I'm like, well, OK, you got me there, but it's not really a good fit. So I didn't publish that either, because the JuiceGS blog is for blog posts about JuiceGS. So I started thinking, well, OK. So I, I have pigeonholed these two topics. Where do people publish stuff like that? So I started developing my own Apple II website. I had some help from Peter Watson, who introduced me to WordPress in the first place. And I spent the summer of August 2009 building this website, had it done, but I, I didn't have anything to say myself, or so I thought. So there was this whole website that was just completely blank for like eight or nine months, until April 2010, when, you know what happened in April 2010, is Gizmodo found an iPhone in a bar, an unreleased prototype, and Apple seized it back. And there were all these news stories about it, including a news story by Jon Stewart. Uh, he was host of The Daily Show, and he did this mock-up, and it shows him back in his college days using an Apple II. I thought, oh, that's really cool, but where can I share this? Where can I tell people, hey, the Apple II showed up on The Daily Show? And I was like, oh, I'll use my own blog. So I wrote a blog post about this, and then I'm like, okay, I can't just push, publish one blog post. I published this on a Monday. I was like, well, I'll do a blog post every Monday, and maybe every Thursday as well. So for the first three years, I published two blog posts a week, and then I cut back to once a week, and I've been doing it every single Monday for the last eight years, writing this Apple II blog post. So I had to figure out what categories am I going to put these posts in. And I came up with several categories, hacks and mods for writing about hardware, happenings for covering events like Kansas Fest, history for saying, hey, I just found out something cool that happened 30 years ago, or here's something about the Apple II that you might not know. Uh, mainstream coverage for like The Daily Show or if USA Today mentions the Apple II or something else. Musings is what Jeopardy would call potpourri. It's just like, mm, here's something I thought of. Uh, people 
for blog posts are actually about people in the Apple II community or the Apple II industry and legacy. Software showcase for writing about software, and then tips and tricks for, hey, here's something cool you can do with your Apple II. And over the last eight years, as I have continued to develop content for this blog post site, I've added three more categories organically, uh, Steve Jobs, Steve Wozniak, and Game Trail. So two specific people, and then also a specific genre of software, that being games, because I like games. And now looking back at how I have used these 11 categories, uh, the most popular one is games, followed by mainstream coverage, history, and musings. Uh, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak are both pretty popular. Obviously, there's more to say about Woz than Jobs. Uh, and I've only used the tips and tricks category once. So in hindsight, I probably should have not used that category at all, because I have nothing useful to tell you about how to use an <laughs> Apple II. <laughs> Who knew? Uh, I have written many posts, and here are the five most popular posts and when they were published. Uh, the Art of Apple. Actually, I'm sorry, that's a typo. It should be The Art of Atari. Cliff Spohn wrote a book about the art of Atari and all the beautiful covers that those games used to have. And he did some art for Apple as well. And that's mentioned in the book. So I wrote a blog post about that. That is my number one most popular blog post. Just wrote it last year. Taking the Apple II online with Ethernet when I got my first internet card, my first Ethernet card. Best computer games from the 1980s. The differences between a ROM 1 and a ROM 3 and how to tell the difference and The Art of the Crack, which is Jason Scott's upload to the Internet Archive of all Apple II crack screens. I wrote a blog post about that. And these categories are Musings, Hacks and Mods, Game Trail, More Hacks and Mods, and Software. So a good mix. So I've been writing these blog posts and hundreds of others for the last eight years. How do I always have something interesting to say, or I hope it's interesting to me, to say about the Apple II? I want to tell you how I got my ideas and how you can get ideas yourself. I would say my creative juices were sparked by two main sources. The first was grad school. I went to Emerson College in Boston while I was working as an editor at Computer World Magazine. I was going for a master's degree in publishing. So I was publishing a magazine by day and studying how to publish magazines by night. Maybe a little bit backwards, but it worked for me. So I did that for three years. And in my second year, in the spring, I took a course called Column Writing. It was groundbreaking for me. It was taught by Professor Jeffrey, Jeffrey Seglin, who is now at Harvard University at the Harvard Kennedy School. And we were 10 students workshopping with each other. We would bring to class columns that we had written that were 500 words each. And we'd share them with the class, and we'd talk about what we liked, what we didn't like, how we could improve them. We'd bring them home, revise those drafts, bring them back, even submit them for publication, which is pretty cool. And the semester started by asking us, what are we going to write about? And there was a great exercise that Professor Seglin gave us about how to come up with ideas. And that exercise, that handout, is actually, with his permission, available in a handout that I'm making available to you online. Uh, this URL will also be at the beginning and end of the presentation. It's kgagney.com slash kfest2018. It's a double-sided handout, so if you see mentions to resources or links in this presentation, they're mostly in the handout as well, so you don't have to worry about taking notes or catching on the live stream later. Uh, it was basically go to someplace like Barnes & Noble, look at all the magazines that are being published, choose three magazines that you like, and come up with six topics that you would want to pitch to that magazine. So come up with 18 ideas. You don't have to write the whole column. Just say, hey, if I was to email the editor-in-chief with a pitch, an elevator pitch for something I want to write about, here's what that story would be. Six ideas each for three different magazines. And then we brought those ideas to class. We workshopped them. At the end of the semester, we did the same exercise again. We went back to the bookstore, looked at the magazines. And it was great. I was pitching ideas for uh, like the Vegetarian Times or Bicycling Magazine and all things that I've never written about but I find fascinating. I was like, what if there was an article on this topic? Because as we learned yesterday from Roger Wagner, the best time to write a book is while you're still learning the subject. So what would you want to say about bicycling that you just learned? Or what would, do you want to learn about bicycling, for example, and do that? You could write an article about how the Apple Macintosh was originally supposed to be called the Apple Bicycle and how that correlates. I don't know. The, so this was a huge boost for my uh, creative energy. The other one comes from The Moth. Anybody here ever listen to The Moth? A handful of people, cool. 
So this is a live event and a podcast hosted by NPR, and it was recommended to me by Kansas Fest alumnus uh, Sierra Saunter back in December 2012. She's like, have you ever heard of this story slam? And I thought, it has the word slam in the title. It's probably too hipster for me. But I ended up really liking it. it so at the moth, people are invited to come up on stage and share a true five-minute story from their own lives in which they are the protagonist. They are given a theme, so the story has to fit a theme. And that's very similar to writing something for a magazine. It has to fit a theme. You don't just get up there with an open mic and say whatever you want. It has to be focused on a specific topic. And at the moth, they have to, the stories have to be five minutes long. And as I've learned from years of transcribing interviews for Juice GS and Computer World, human speech is about 100 words a minute. So five minutes of speech is 500 words, which is the same length as a column, which I learned to write at Emerson. So I was getting up at the moth, I was telling stories, I was writing columns for Juice GS, for Computer World, for my class, and it was all very similar structures. Beginning, middle, and end has to have a narrative weave and I've really enjoyed telling stories at the Moth. I've become a frequent storyteller. Uh, these are four of my stories. The topics or the themes were happy, do-over, accidents, and love hurts. I've also told stories on chemistry, office, and now or never. Uh, I made it to the Grand Slam in Boston and actually tied for first place. So that was where like, they invite back the previous winners for the best of the best, and I made my mark there. And the Apple II has actually been a source of inspiration. Half of the stories right here are about the Apple II. Happy and Do-Over are about the Apple II. And the accident story, that's the only one you can actually see just by Googling like Ken Gagne Moth. The other stories are all behind passwords, but the accident story is free for the public to find. So I'm coming up with all these stories all the time. And if you're looking for stories to tell, here are some sources you might look for, which I found useful, is Something that happened at Kansas Fest, somebody you met at Kansas Fest, a session you attended at Kansas Fest, something you found inspirational or something you want to explore further, even to like a note to yourself, hey, I just picked up this book, I'm looking forward to reading it. Something you bought on eBay, hey, I found this really weird card, I don't know what it does, can anybody help me identify it? Or I've never had a mockingbird before and now I do, here's what I'm gonna do with it. Responding to a magazine article, one of the most overlooked resources at the Garage Giveaway, in my opinion, are the stacks and stacks of magazines. Because there isn't that volume of content being produced about the Apple II nowadays. You can pick up one issue of Soft Talk, it's like 100 pages, read all the articles, and there's like seven or eight blog posts you could write from that. Like saying, hey, here's what's happened since that article was published, here's something I'm gonna try, here's something I never knew, and just share that with the world. You listen to a podcast. There are so many podcasts about retro computers. There's Open Apple, the Retro Computing Roundtable, the Retro MacCast, One Megahertz, so many others. You could listen to a podcast and just say, hey, I, I found this episode and I really enjoyed it. Uh, personal stories, you know, here's something that happened to me when I was growing up. Here is the first time I found an Apple II when my dad brought me to work. Here's the educational lab that I learned about the Apple II in elementary school and what it was like to have an Apple II at school and not at home, or vice versa. A weekend project. You're probably going to co go home from Kansas Fest inspired with lots of ideas. And you're going to spend a weekend just hacking at something. You'll, you'll upload a personal diary to say, hey, here's how far I've made it this week in Lawless Legends, for example. Uh, modern projects inspired by the Apple II, like uh, Raspberry Pi is a small, constrained, educational device just like an Apple II. Here's something that you could do that is like that. Or there's a new Bard's Tale coming out. There's a third Wasteland game coming out. Those are franchises that started on the Apple II. What do you think about the new Bard's Tale? Are you going to play it? Have you played it? Did you name your characters the same thing you did in the original game? Did you port your characters over from 30 years ago? And also, Google Alerts. You're going to set up a Google alert for any time the phrase Apple II is mentioned on the internet, you get a ping. Or any time VisiCalc or Steve Wozniak. You can, if somebody wants to set up a website called wozwatch.com, where you report on every public appearance Steve Wozniak makes, I would love that. Uh, that was an idea that Paul Zaleski suggested to me here at Kansas Fest like 10 years ago. And I was like, I should do that. Even though Steve Wozniak has his own website, you can do it better than him. <laughs> and that'd be creepy. 
<laughs> so. Now, not everything you find, not everything you want to write about is going to be a good fit for your own personal blog. For example, if you get a ping about Apple II showing up in a news story, sometimes the Apple II is mentioned to give something else context, but the story isn't about the Apple II. Like, they might open by saying, the year was 1977, the Apple II was new, and so-and-so was about to embark on their adventure. You know, the story's not about the Apple II. They're just saying, hey, this is how old things were back then. This is what was happening. So, for example, I recently saw a story about someone who used to write property management software for the Apple II back in the 80s, and he just got an award for Lifetime Achievement Award from the National Apartment Association. I didn't really feel like there was a story there. It was just, okay, he is now a realtor, and he did this thing 30 years ago. So that was a tweet, not a 500-word blog post. Or sometimes the story might I have found to be so big that it outgrows my blog. So for example, I started writing an art, a blog post about here's how to buy something on eBay. And I was like, if I really want to do this comprehensively, that's not going to be 500 words. And so it became a full-fledged Juice GS article that somebody else wrote. Or when Steve Godzilla, Steve Godzilla, former head of the Kansas Fest Committee, passed away a year or two ago, I started writing a little tribute to him on my blog, and then I realized not everybody who knew him is going to see this. I should put this in Juice GS. And so it became my editorial for the next quarterly issue. And other stories, like I said, are just too big or too broad appeal. Recently, Microsoft bought GitHub, and I started just writing a little blog post that said, hey, here are all the Apple II users who use GitHub that are affected by this. And as I started researching, I realized, wow, there are a lot of people who use GitHub. And I'm like, mm, maybe this should be in just yes. And I, so I reached out to all those people who I was listing and said, what do you think about Microsoft buying your GitHub? And they wrote back, and that became a Just Yes article. And there are still other stories that I've started to write in similar fashion that I realized, oh, this is going to be big, and I'm still working on that for Just Yes. So you have all these ideas, I hope, or you know where to find them. How do you get them out into the world? Well, you won't be surprised that I would suggest that you use WordPress. WordPress is a content management system that was invented in 2003. It is now 15 years and two months old. Just turned 15 in May. And it powers 31% of all new websites that launch. Of websites that use a CMS, because not all websites do, but of the CMS market, it has a 60% share. More than half of all websites that use a CMS are using WordPress. And one of the reasons it's so popular, several of the reasons, are because it's free, it's open source, meaning that you can modify it and distribute it however you like, and it's not tied to a corporation. So unlike Wix, Weebly, or Squarespace, you're not tied to a corporation and their profits and their continued existence. If Squarespace goes out of business, they're probably going to take your website with them. And even if you export your content, you'll never again see the engine, the user interface that you used to build that website because it was proprietary. The company that makes, or the company associated with WordPress could go out of business tomorrow and your website will be fine. So that's very encouraging. You can, you can customize it, you can modify it however you want, as I mentioned. It has an extensive plugin architecture which means you can extend it in all different ways to make it do things it was never meant to do, kind of like the seven slots in the Apple II. Uh, my website is running on WordPress, and I used to host it on DreamHost, which is very affordable. They're kind of like GoDaddy, which you may have heard of. Uh, I've since moved it to WP Engine, uh, but I still use DreamHost for some things, so either of those is fine. I find WP Engine a little bit more expensive, but also a little bit more stable. And I should offer the full disclosure <coughs> that I work for Automatic, hence the shirt. Uh, they are the company that makes WordPress.com, which is the commercial version. You can go to WordPress.com and set up your own free blog immediately, but then there are paid add-ons, like a freemium model, and those upgrades are how Automatic, the company that makes WordPress.com, makes money. Uh, WordPress.com's CEO is the inventor of WordPress, but WordPress itself is free and open source. Now, I'm not here as a representative of my company. They would not send me to an Apple II convention. Uh, I'm here on my own. I'm representing myself. And also, I have given presentations about WordPress before at Kansas Fest six years ago. I did a talk July of 2012, WordPress for Dummies. And even six years before that, 
is when I started using WordPress, when Syndicom Online closed, that was a web-based and telnet-based online service for Apple II users, I ran several forums or fora on that service. <clears throat> and when it closed in 2006, I was like, what am I going to do now? And Peter Watson, there's that name again, said, why don't you start a blog? And so I looked up WordPress, I started using that. So I've been using WordPress for 12 years, and I've only been working for the WordPress company for six months. So I was an enthusiast and an evangelist well before I was an employee. Pardon me while I hydrate. Any questions? Good, I hate questions. Okay, so. I talked about content generation, ideas. You want to marry the content with the presentation. You want to look like an Apple II website, whatever that may mean to you or to your readers. I use a theme called Retro Mac OS by Stuart Brown. It was released in 2010, so it's an eight-year-old WordPress theme, which doesn't exactly follow modern design standards. It was actually adopted as an official theme that WordPress.com users could use in October of 2011. Does anybody know why that date? Two days earlier, Steve Jobs had passed away. And the CEO of Automatic said, let's pay tribute to Steve Jobs by letting people make their website look like a retro Mac. And so this is what it looked like, or this is what my website would look like using that theme. Uh, it's a classic Mac, black and white interface, so early version of Mac OS. It's got uh, the icons. Uh, the Apple icon, the upper left. But there are some things I didn't like about it, which was the content column was kind of narrow. It was black and white. The icons were all generic. They were not representative of what you were actually clicking on. And, of course, as the name implies, retro Mac, not retro Apple. But WordPress is customizable. So using what's called a child theme, I was able to modify this to be a little bit more representative of an Apple II. Now we're using Apple II icons. Each icon ties into what you're clicking on. It's in color. The main content column is wider. And it's just more representative of what my blog is about. The content is about the Apple II. The theme looks like an Apple II. They're wed together. However, you can still use the Retro Mac theme if you want. And in fact, other websites do. Uh, Lawless Legends uses the Retro Mac theme. So you can go to their website, and it might look similar to mine. You might wonder why. It's because we're using the same parent theme. I've heavily modified mine, but originally it looked like that. Now this theme, as I mentioned, is a little bit on the older side and has since been retired. The, uh, you can't use it on WordPress.com anymore. The official website where I downloaded it eight years ago is not available anymore. Uh, I found it somewhere else online, and you can download it from kgaggy.com slash retromacOS. That's just a redirect link that will send you to somebody else's site where I found it. Since it is an older theme, it is not what is called responsive. A responsive theme means that the theme, the website automatically adapts to whatever size of screen it's being displayed on. Whether it's a laptop, a 5K monitor, an iPad tablet, an iPad mini, an iPhone, whatever size it is, a responsive website looks good on anything. Uh, my site, by default, does not look very good on mobile. It looks like this. It looks exactly like it does on the desktop, which means a lot of pinching and zooming to be able to read the text. That is not an optimal experience. Uh, WordPress offers a plugin called Jetpack, which will enable a mobile version of your website, and that looks like this. Now, the downside to Jetpack is that every website that uses Jetpack's mobile feature will look like this. It's generic. It doesn't, it's not customized to your theme. So people visiting my website on their mobile device won't see all that Apple II customization I did, but at least they'll be able to read it. And to, uh, so far, although mobile traffic to my website is increasing year over year, it's still predominantly desktop. So for now, I'm okay with this. If you want to use WordPress, I mentioned Jetpack as a plugin. There are some others that I briefly want to mention because plugins are great. They make everything better. Uh, and they're going to be, I could do a whole talk on Kansas Fest about WordPress. This is just sort of a brief encapsulation. And again, these are listed in my handout as well. But a kismet blocks spam, whether that's being a comment on your blog or somebody filling out the contact form to email you, it'll block that. Jetpack, I just mentioned, allows you to create those contact forms, which allows you to obscure your email address, which itself is a good way to block spam. 
Also turns on a content delivery network for your images, so images load faster. So you have more options about how images are displayed on your website. iTheme Security Pro is another freemium plugin. Actually, so is Jetpack. It blocks hackers and malware. I have found it very useful because my sites historically got hacked before I knew better. Updraft Plus is a freemium plugin for backing up your website. It can back up both the files, like your images that you upload, as well as your SQL database where all your content is stored, and put it on your Amazon S3, your Dropbox, another FTP server, download as a zip, whatever. Makes it very easy to back up your site and migrate as if you need to. Redirection allows you to create a URL that points somewhere else, kind of like I did with kgagging.com slash retro macOS which is not only handy for short URLs, but also if a page on your site, you decide to move it to a different address, this will send the old address to the new one. Open external links in new window is a podcasting plugin. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, it opens external links in new windows. So it keeps, people, it keeps another tab on your browser that your site is in. And then when you, somebody goes somewhere else, it opens up in a new tab. Uh, Smush and WP Featherlight are two image plugins. One, the first one compresses images so that they're small, so people accessing your website on mobile aren't eating up all their data. And Featherlight just allows images to open up in a nice shadow box or a light box. Uh, and finally, post archival in the Internet Archive. As soon as you click publish on a blog post, it'll trigger the Wayback Machine and create a snapshot of that blog post in the Internet Archive, which is very handy. Uh, all of these plugins and more can be found at my list of favorite WordPress plugins, which is kgagging.com slash plugins, which is a 301 redirect. So you have the theme, you have the content, you have the publishing platform, you have the plugins. How do people find and stay on your website? Let's talk a little bit about discovery and retention. I took a look at my Google Analytics for my website to figure out where are people coming from? How are people finding my website, Apple 2Bits? And it is mostly organic search. 58% of people coming to my website are just typing in words in Google and finding my website. They've never heard of my website before. They may never come back, but more than half of my traffic originates that way at least. 26% are direct, which means they're either typing the URL into their address bar or they have it bookmarked. They're coming right to my site. 9% is social, which means I'm sharing my content on Twitter and Facebook, and hopefully other people are as well and people are clicking on that link and coming to my website. 6% is referral, which means other websites are linking to mine. Uh, and 2% is email. So I'm emailing people about my website and they're coming by clicking on those links. Now I previously mentioned my five most popular posts. There's actually one page on my website that is more popular than any of those. Does anybody know what the most popular page on my website is? Any guesses? About me? People don't care about me. <laughs> but there's one thing that 39 years on this earth has taught me, is that nobody cares about me. I care about you, Ken. Okay, so Sheppy. Sheppy cares. But uh, it's the home page. Just apple2bits.net. Not any particular blog post, but the home page. However, only 17% of all my traffic actually comes to the home page. That's like an eighth of all my traffic almost is going to the home page, which means that most of my visitors are, never see the home page. If you have a website that has a different home page layout or design than the individual articles, like most websites do nowadays, most visitors will never see that home page. At my last day job, we were talking about, oh, let's put this big banner on the home page that lets people know that our parking lot is closed due to construction. I'm like, great idea. 80% of people will never see it because they're going right to another page on the website from Google, from Facebook, whatever. If you want somebody to see something at my workplace, we had to put it on every page, a site-wide banner. <coughs> so it's important to have the home page because it is the most important, the most popular page, but proportionally, all your other pages are far more important. Which means it's important to get search engine optimization. Most people are going to those other sites, as I said, 58% are doing it through search. And SEO is how you optimize your website to make sure you show up high in the Google ranks. Most people don't click past the first page of Google search results. So if you're not in those top 10 hits, you're probably not going to get any traffic from Google. A good WordPress plugin to help you with that is Yoast SEO. It will help you optimize your website. 
it'll actually scan your content and give you like a green, yellow, or red light on how well it's likely to perform on Google. And you can take its advice and rewrite your content or add additional metadata that sites will pick up on. For example, it lets you write SEO descriptions. So this is a Google search result for one of my blog posts. And right there, there's a little summary. My dad, Edward F. Gagney, is the family's original gamer, as seen in this YouTube interview for Father's Day. Now that actual sentence doesn't show up in my blog post. If you click through to the website, you won't see that phrase. But it's something that I wrote specifically through Yoast to show up in Google. And now if somebody were to Google, for example, uh, Edward F. Gagney Gamer or uh, Gagney YouTube, you know, this has those keywords and is likely to show up high for those search terms. You can also write descriptions for social media optimization. <clears throat> Very similar to SEO, this is how your websites will look on Facebook and Twitter. So that same blog post shows up on Facebook like this. It has, I can write whatever I want up here, but then it also has a title, a little description, and a photo. Again, that photo does not actually show up on the blog post. If you click through the blog post, there's a YouTube video, but that photo is unique to Facebook because it's something that I added in Yoast to say, hey, when people link to my website on Facebook, this is the image you should tell Facebook to show. And it was an easy way to customize my links because links with photos get more clicks. Uh, let's see. Now, when you're playing in Twitter or Facebook and you gain links from that audience, you're playing in somebody else's sandbox. We all know that Facebook and Twitter have algorithms and you're not gonna see everything so you want to establish a direct relationship with people, an unfiltered one that guarantees your message is going to get through to them. And for that, I recommend MailChimp. The most personal relationship you can have with your readership is through email, because that way you actually know who they are and how to contact them. Now, yes, there are spam filters, and we've had that problem for 30 years, but it's not an algorithm that says, oh, I'm going to show you your friend, this friend's post, but not this friend's post. If I'm your friend, you're going to get all my emails. Whether or not you read them is up to you, but that's a decision you make, not a decision Facebook is making for you. There are a lot of email service providers like MailChimp. Uh, Aweber comes highly recommended, Mad Mimi, a bunch of others, uh, Constant Contact, for example. I like MailChimp because it has a free plan. There are paid versions, but for an Apple II website, I have found the free version to be great because it's good for up to 2,000 subscribers and up to 12,000 emails a month. So for example, if you have 2,000 subscribers, you can send six emails a month. If you have one subscriber, you can email them 12,000 times a month. And congratulations if they don't unsubscribe. Uh, also, this is what's called a lead gen opportunity. You are learning who your customers are directly. You're getting their email address. With Facebook and Twitter, you don't know who your readers actually are or how to get through that algorithm to contact them. But with MailChimp, you know exactly who they are and you can use that email address for something else if you want. In this case, you're gonna set up an RSS to email campaign, which means every time you write a blog post, you don't need to then copy and paste it into MailChimp. WordPress has a feature called RSS <clears throat> that is basically a feed of all your content. It can either be the first paragraph and then they have to click through to your website to read the rest, or it can be all your content, your choice. And whichever it is, you just connect that feature to MailChimp and MailChimp will take that content and email it to people. And then they can read it right in their email reader or they can click through to your website. So it's an RSS to email campaign, which you can then segment because when you ask people to sign up for your email list, you can ask for additional information like, what is your favorite model of Apple II? And then once you have that information, you can send them emails based on that. You can tell MailChimp, send every Wednesday's email to the two GS readers and every Friday's email to the two e-readers or something like that. So you can segment out your readership so that they're only getting this content that interests them. You can even segment it further to say, only send it to people who didn't open the last email. And you can send them the same email and say, hey, in case you missed it last week, here's what you missed, which is very nice for e-commerce. If you're doing a promotion 
and you're trying to sell something, you're saying, hey, this coupon, ex you send an email on Monday, this coupon expires on Friday. And by Friday, everybody who hasn't made a purchase yet, who hasn't converted into a sale, you can send just those people another email saying, hey, the sale ends tonight. And all the people who did make the purchase aren't getting spammed to take advantage of an offer that they already took advantage of. Or if you do want to email them again, you can send them a separate email saying, hey, thanks for making your purchase. Remember, this is good for your friends too, so if you want to buy something for them or share the coupon with them, you have 24 more hours. So it's a great way to personalize your, inf your information. <coughs> MailChimp uh, has what's called an open rate. It can actually tell who opens the email in their inbox as opposed to just seeing the subject line and ignoring it or deleting it. Uh, in the computer and electronics industry, the average open rate in MailChimp is 19%. On my blog, it's 45%. Because this is not commercial email, this is people wanting to read this content. They specifically signed up to receive it. Also, the click rate. People who actually click a link in the email and go somewhere, whether it's back to my blog, a related resource that I mentioned, etc. Again, industry average is only 2%. Uh, Apple 2 bits, it's 5%. So I'm doing more than double in each of those categories, which means I have a very engaged audience. The click rate would probably be higher if I wasn't sending them all the content in the email. If I was just sending them the first paragraph and saying, to read the rest, go to my website, I'd probably get a higher click through rate that way. But since my website doesn't have ads, I don't actually care if they come to the website or not. I'm happy for them to just be reading the content wherever they find most convenient. Similar to MailChimp was a service called FeedBurner. I, I know Steve has used FeedBurner. I, uh, it's an ancient RSS enhancer. It adds more features to your RSS feed. It's now owned by Google. And this is worrisome because this is the same Google that killed Google Reader, which was a great RSS reader. So I now have in my head the idea that Google hates RSS. So why would they keep up with FeedBurner? FeedBurner is difficult to configure. It can result in multiple RSS feeds uh, that you are confusing your readers with which one to subscribe to. And you can always export your FeedBurner list into MailChimp. FeedBurner used to be how I would offer my subscribers an email option. Now I've taken all that information and put them into MailChimp. Ivan? To further support your theory, the Chrome browser is, I think, the only browser that has no native recognition of RSS at all. It just comes out as a, as a, as a plain text bill. So Google Chrome is the only modern browser Ivan's aware of that no longer recognizes RSS. It just supports it as plain XML. So that supports the theory that Google hates RSS. So thank you. So I recommend not ever using FeedBurner. <laughs> you may have heard of it, stay away from it. If you're using it now, you can, it's not too late to migrate. <laughs> Another way to retain your audience once you get them on your website is to allow comments on your content. Allow them to engage with it. A Kismet blocks most of the spam. I don't get a lot of hate. I don't think I've ever had to delete a comment from my Apple 2Bits website. Uh, the most popular blog posts in terms of comments are the best computer games from the 1980s. Everybody has a favorite computer game from the 1980s. They all want to let you know, or let me know, which one that is. Staving off burnout, which was about five years ago, I was like, I'm doing too many Apple II things. Kansas Fest, Juice, Yes, and Open Apple. I need to stop doing something. What should I stop doing? And I asked for people to let me know what I should stop doing. And a lot of people told me, you should stop doing this. <laughs> and I was like, thanks, I think. <laughs> uh, I wanted to get a license plate for my car that was inspired by the Apple II. And again, I asked for people's ideas. Uh, ultimately, I settled on the license plate Juiced, which was not available the year that this blog post went up, which was like six, seven years ago. Juiced became available last year, and it's now mine, and it's on my car. And it was only after getting the license plate and publishing Juiced GS for 11 years that I found out that Juiced is a metaphor for being on steroids. <laughs> I've gotten pulled over so many times. <laughs> Why didn't somebody tell me before? Thank you. Uh, the Apple II showed up on Pawn Stars. I wrote a blog post about that. That was very popular because people started leaving comments saying, how much could I get for my Apple II? And people started replying, you could get this much for your Apple II. Uh, the Art of the Crack, which I mentioned earlier. People love crack screens or just pirating, I guess. And the first game I ever played because everybody has a first game that they ever played and they want to share their own memories. That's one of those personal memory stories I suggested you could write. 
So I've been doing this for about eight years. I want to briefly look at what sort of reception my blog has gotten over all that. Uh, what has it accomplished? Well, I've written 535 posts. Remember, it used to be twice a week. Now it's once a week. Uh, cumulatively, that is more than weekly over eight years. I've written 200,000 words, which I think is about 10 times longer than my uh, thesis. So I could write 10 theses and have 10 degrees or one Apple II blog. I think that's a fair trade, right? Uh, the average length of each post is only 375 words. Sometimes if I'm embedding a YouTube video, I will let that do the talking for me. I might introduce it and provide some context and some original analysis, synthesis, and interpretation, but 375 words is not actually a lot. If you were writing a typed, double-spaced Microsoft Word document, that would be about a page and a half. So, not bad. My longest post was 2,000 words, and that was about saving up burnout. Surprisingly, I was so burnt out that I had 2,000 words to say about it. No wonder I was burnt out. Uh, I've gotten 556 comments, so that's at least, on average, one comment per post. Some posts get none, and then I have a post that gets dozens, so it varies. 180,000 page views. Now, I used to work at Computer World Magazine. They would get 9 million page views a month. That's a very different business, a very different economy. They have a huge publishing and marketing wing. I'm not selling anything. I don't need people to come to my website. So 180,000 page views on some scales isn't a lot. I'm very happy with it. I like it. And that comes from 100,000 different people. That's how many d unique users have been to my website in eight years. 100,000 people who, on some level, are interested in the Apple II. That's amazing. Imagine if they all came to Kansas Fest. <laughs> Steve. <laughs> now to put a few more chairs in here. Yeah, lots more. <laughs> I want to share two specific examples of blog posts that I am really happy with the results of. One was, I never had this peripheral called the ALF music card, but you may be familiar with it from this advertisement that showed up in magazines, where somebody had modified an Apple II to have a guitar, and he's playing it. And I wrote a blog post, I'm like, I think this is a great ad. It reminds me of Guitar Hero, but 25 years before that game was ever invented. And, and who is that person in the ad? Well, I did some searching, and I think it's a guy named Bill Ficus. I don't know who Bill Ficus is, but I think that's who that is in the ad. Well, Google is a wonderful thing. I got a comment from Bill Ficus. <laughs> He's like, hey, I found your website, and I'm the guy in the ad. And every now and then, he still shows up on my blog just leaving comments. And probably someday, I'm going to reach out to him and say, hey, I'd love to interview you for Juice GS about your Guitar Hero or whatever. But now I have his email address because he loved to comment on my website. And I know how to reach the guy in the ad who I previously knew nothing about. Also, Brady Brandt. One year, I was driving from Boston to Denver and on the way, I stopped in western Massachusetts at the house of Thomas Compter, who has been to Kansas Fest. He was getting rid of boatloads of Apple II publications. And he said, hey, as long as you're going out to Denver and then to Kansas Fest, can you bring them to the garage giveaway? So I said, sure. Andy Malloy and I stopped at Thomas's house, picked up all these bins of magazines. While Andy was driving, I reached out behind the seat, grabbed a random issue, started flipping through it. I got the uh, NOG AppleWorks forum. And I was reading one of those. And I was like, oh, here's an article that I could write a blog post about. Like I said earlier, you read an old magazine, you write a blog post about an article. I'm like, here's an article I read by Brandy Brandt, who, as we know, created various versions of AppleWorks and many other programs. Well, I then got an email uh, from, well, actually, no. So I made my trip to Denver, and I showed up there, and I found out that there was a local Apple users group. And so I wanted, I reached out to them and I said, hey, I'm in Denver for the summer and I know all about the Apple II. They said, would you like to come speak at Denver Apple Pie? I said, that'd be great. So I have that all set up. And then, again, Google is a fascinating thing. Somebody found my NOG AppleWorks form blog post. He emailed me and I said, hey, great to meet you. Where do you live? He's like, oh, I live in Denver. I was like, I'm in Denver. I'm coming to Denver Apple Pie. He's like, wow, I haven't been to Denver Apple Pie in 20 years. I'll come attend your talk. So I attended the talk, and so did Randy Brandt. I had written a blog post about him through Google. He had a Google alert set up for his name. He found my website, 
he came to Denver Apple Pie, so did Mike McGinnis, who lives in Denver. They established a friendship. They kept, Mike was evangelizing Kansas Fest, and a year later, Randy Brandt was the keynote speaker at Kansas Fest and received the Apple II Forever Award because he had a Google Alert set up to find my blog post, and I was in Denver, and I, it's bizarre. But if I hadn't reached behind the seat and grabbed that issue of NOG, if I hadn't read that article by Randy Brandt, if I hadn't published a blog post that had his name in it, all these other connections would not have happened. You know, and obviously, mad props to Mike McGinnis for making the other connections and bringing him here, because they both live in Denver and they were able to carpool. But you never know who's gonna read your website, who is gonna stumble across your blog. So I encourage you to have to discover what your story is about the Apple II and to share it online. Set up a blog, post some photos, uh, embed a YouTube video, get some keywords out there that will show up in Google, and share it. I, again, have a handout at kgagging.com slash kfest2018. One page is the idea generation exercise that I mentioned I experienced at Emerson College. You don't need to pay $30,000 for a master's degree. This handout is free and is distributed with the permission of the instructor who devised it. And the other page is links to all the resources I mentioned regarding WordPress, MailChimp, et cetera. Uh, any questions about blogging about the Apple II? Mark. Is the search engine optimization software Yoast a plugin to WordPress? <coughs> Yoast is a plugin to WordPress. Okay. There, there are other SEO plugins for WordPress, one is called SEO Framework, another one is called All-in-One SEO Pack. Your mileage may vary. Some people find Yoast to be bloated, but it is the one officially recommended by my employer, WordPress.com. So the, the, m WordPress itself, as a piece of software, does 80% of the SEO right out of the box. For the last 15 to 20%, you'll need a plugin and that's all up to editorial decisions. WordPress as a piece of software can't make you write content that has keywords in the right spots. Yoast helps you do that. So. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Charles. Have you written any of your Apple II blog posts on an Apple II? And if so, how did you workflow that from that into WordPress? Have I written any of my blog posts on an Apple II? And how did I workflow it to get back onto the Apple II? So I have not written my blog post on an Apple II, unfortunately. I wrote stories about the Apple II for computerworld.com on an Apple II. And that actually got mentioned in the footer of the story. Like, hey, uh, BTW, this is written on Apple II. Just to be a little meta about that. Uh, what I tend to use instead and somehow I forgot to put this in my slides, was a program called Mars Edit. I use Mars Edit, whoa, hi, on the Mac. Oh, gosh. Uh, I know I'm almost out of time. I have like one minute left. Let me turn off mirroring here, which should help with the display. And, or turn on mirroring, rather. There we go. That's even worse. Great. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, this is Mars Edit. It allows, it connects to your WordPress blog and allows you to download all the content that's on there and edit it. So it's a local offline Mac client for WordPress and other CMSs. Uh, you can uh, save offline drafts. So this is a whole list of all the Apple II Bits blog posts that I haven't written yet. But like I found a website, I was like, oh, I should go back to that website and write a blog post about it. So I saved the link in my local drafts folder, I file it under Apple II bits because I have a lot of blogs, as you can see. And whenever I need something to write about, I just open up one of those. I'm like, oh, I'm glad I saved this. I can write about it later. And it also lets you see what your blog post will actually look like when it is published. So on the left there is my draft about Richard Garriott on the moth. And on the right is what it will look like when it goes up on my website. So I have a local template that dynamically updates as I'm updating on the left. Kind of like in the old days with Dreamweaver, you'd have the raw HTML on the left and the processed HTML on the right. This is similar. Uh, so Mars Edit is the program that I use for composing most of my stuff. I then upload it into WordPress and make my final tweaks there before I click publish. 
If anybody else has any other questions, you're welcome to hit me up on email, uh, on my blog at apple2bits.net. There's a contact form there. Or at Kansas Fest. Thank you so much.